Welcome to the lecture. Um, my name is Anna Kaisa Kultima, and this is Games Now, as you know. Games Now is an open lecture series, which means that you can always invite your friends here, and we also stream it, so anybody can access it. Uh, this is about game development, and we run it about once a month at Aalto University. In order to take the full advantage of what we can offer, please follow our social media channels, meaning YouTube, where we are currently streaming, and Facebook, where we're also streaming, but a bit less well. Today we have one of the best Finnish indie houses presenting their work. Um, so Nolla Games is Petri Purho, Olli Harjola, and Arvi Teikari today talking about Noita and specifically all the fun that has been put into making it. I hope. Mm. It's an exciting time. Uh, Arv is living a jet, jet, uh, jet jet life, so he's on an airplane, maybe already landed. So we're not absolutely sure if we can get him today here for the presentations, but we'll pull him in as soon as he arrives. Without further ado, I'll give the stage to the first speaker of the day, Petri Burho. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think I'll just continue playing this. How long did I have to kill time for? 15 minutes <laughs> before Arby arrives. Okay. So actually, uh, how many here uh, of you have played Noita or know about it? Okay, so fairly, fairly big portion. So hopefully this early demo here kind of showed a little bit about the game so I don't have to go into detail about like what you do in this game and so forth. I think that's okay. Or is there someone who wants to know more about the game? We all want to know more. <laughs> but like, know more about the game specifically as, as in the game, how the game plays. You really want to know more? Yeah, the goal. The goal? Uh, do you want the lore explanation or what you, no. The, the lore, is, lore is forbidden. I'm not allowed to talk about it, so. <laughs> Secret. Uh, Okay, so I'll briefly tell a little bit about what Noita is then, and how it plays. So, it is a permadeath roguelike uh, set in this world where every pixel has uh, physical properties. So, for example, here you can you can see here uh, near my inventory it tells you what material things are made out of. So that tells this is a kind of a boring place because everything is made out of bricks here. But you could also have, we have some potions. So I'll just show this potion here. And you can see it releases some water here. And then the water is simulated as water should be sort of simulated. You can see there is a lamp that's hanging from the roof. So if I shoot the lamp, uh, it's an oil lamp. So it released some oil and then it set the oil on fire. So now you can see the oil is burning on top of the water. And that's generating steam. And the steam is condensating here at the top. And then you can see it drop down as, as it goes. So that's the engine part of the game. And essentially, the way the game plays is there's two parts to it. One of it's uh, sort of a 2D sold at shoot em up thing where you go deeper and deeper and you collect gold. And then with the gold, once you get deep enough, you get to these holy mountains. And here you can kind of like purchase new magic wands. So now I have 275. Thanks to Mika, maybe I will... Maybe we will get this thing. Once you make it into this far enough in this... into these holy mountains, you can also edit your magic wands that you have. So the basic magic wand you start with shoots these purple things. And it's this one here. So it's got two of these purple things and then it loads for a little bit. So what you can do is you can take these purple things out of here and then you can put something else in. So we can put this energy 
sphere in here and then it'll shoot these energy spheres and run out of mana apparently immediately uh, then I've got another wand here and this shoots these bombs that explode which I apparently threw in the water uh, but I can also like into this this one and it, it should shoot more rapidly and then you can do crazier things so there's also modifiers so this will make a fire trail so now when I shoot the purple thing there's gonna be like a trail of fire underneath it which will set things on fire uh, and what do we have okay so this thing is gonna has a trigger on it so what it means it's gonna shoot first this green arrow and then when it hits something, it's going to shoot the purple thing out of there. And then you can obviously put these, like there's some explosive things here. You can put those in there. So when you shoot somewhere for this, which... Uh, with the mana. So now it's going to shoot this green thing and there's going to be a bomb that's going to be dropped from there. It's going to explode. And then the next thing up here is you also get these perks, which modify your things. So this here is gives you faster movement. This here is called saving grace, which would save me if I die once. And this is lucky mutation, which gives me these uh, spider legs and changes how I, I can kind of like move. So, oh. I, I did not modify my wands at all for this. So this is going to die and then we can actually get into the what I was going to talk about. Uh. Oh yeah, I was supposed to lower the volume for better audio mixing, but... I'm just going to show this place a little bit, I guess. Well, I'm dying. Oh god. Oh yeah, this is this is kind of cool. This guy shoots... Uh, oh my god, this is a bad idea. So everything is on fire. So he shoots these electric bolts and then the electricity... Uh, kills everything <laughs> hopefully also me this is a bit hard to control because you have to it changes the the legs change your movement pattern so now you have to be sort of hugging these walls in order to get to places which i'm not that used to okay. let me murder myself here if i can Can't get out of here. Here we go. Oh, my God. So most of these levels are procedurally generated, but there's uh, sort of an overall structure to the game. It's the, I guess the quick demo of, of what Noita is. Thank you. So, so the three of us, uh, me, uh, Oli, and Arvi are going to give sort of separate presentations, or we had that was our plan. And now Arvi is sort of late, so we don't know if he's going to give a presentation. But Oli's going to talk a little bit more about like how the falling sand simulation stuff works. Uh, where, what's the history of the game, and how it 
if I can find my stuff here. So, how much time do I have? Five to ten minutes? Okay. I'll, you can be you can be the judge. So when it when it gets too boring, you you <laughs> boot me out of here. So, okay, that's perfect. I'm just waiting for Ollie to boot me. So back in 2007, so where where this sort of Noita came from. participated a game competition called Gamma 256, which was in Montreal. And the idea of the competition was that you had to make a game resolution 256 times 256 and lower. So what I realized when I heard the restriction is that if you have a very low resolution, what it means is that you can use a lot of CPU power per pixel, which you couldn't do back in the day. So then I had been, I mean, playing around with these falling sand simulations forever. So I made this game for that, which is called Bloody Zombies. And this is uh, inspired by uh, a classic movie, Brain Dead, from um, Peter Jackson. And so you're this guy who's got a lawnmower, and there's these zombies, and then you get the blood out of the zombies by mowing the lawn <laughs> uh, uh, from the zombies. Uh, and the general idea is you have to collect these keys and then you get to the next level. And what you can also do is you can blood surf with your lawnmower. So usually I can just like jump this high, but if I use the lawnmower in the blood, I can kind of like jump way higher. And that's the sort of general crux of this game is like you go around uh, getting blood out of the zombies, like here. Like here you can't get out of here. Oh, you can actually. Before l killing all these zombies and getting this blood out of there. Wha Let's see if we can even finish this level and be done with it. Uh, let's murder these. That should be it. So that's this is pretty much the. Uh, it was made like in a, in a week, uh, and this is essentially uses what this does is this uses the sort of falling sand simulation stuff, and then it's got a separate particle system on top of it, which allows for them to kind of like fly around, and this was back in 2007. So 2000. The rest of 2007, 2008, I used uh, working on crayon physics, which came out in early 2009. So then I was thinking of like what to do next, and this was one of those things is I only spent one week on this game, and there were like all these things that I thought about, like could I add other materials besides blood to it? Like could I do rigid bodies and stuff like that? And so I started thinking about that, and thinking of what kind of a game to do with that and working towards it. Uh, but as sort of a side note before we get to those, I started also testing things um, like how to um, how to do pixel art, right? Because like if you do low resolution pixel art, you can do other things. So one of the ideas I had was to like render the pixels and different ways, so I made this game as sort of a, like a test of that shooter. Look into his eyes. And here, you essentially, the, the pixels are made posted nodes, and you just like shoot these uh, space invader creatures. And what uh, sort of very apparent from making this game is that even though like there, there's a huge difference between pixel solutions right this is 
something like 64 times maybe 24 or something like that. I don't know even if that it might be 48 pixels. Anyway, this is like s when you have very low resolution, you can get like a lot of CPU power per pixel and you could kind of render them in an interesting way, but then also like size. Uh, I made, in 2010, I made another test of that, which was called Maze of Space. This sort of is another way of rendering the pixels uh, in this, oh my god, I'm just gonna die here. Yeah, This is a roguelite, so what's the keys? So you, you go around in this maze of space and you shoot at enemies. And this was sort of the main purpose of this was also to kind of like test if like there are various different art styles that could be done with pixel art that would allow sort of a more interesting look with less pixels. But it was also like evident here, as you can see, uh, in order to do like shooting in low resolution, uh, you have to like, there. there's a, they can miss essentially like, so it's not pick, it's not pixel perfect, so to speak. The enemies can kind of like miss because otherwise it's really hard to kind of like move around and avoid with this like supremely low resolution. But anyway, these were in the back of my mind when I was playing around with these things, but I realized that you kind of need a bigger resolution in order to do this. Uh, so then we get essentially to this thing, which is in 2011. Uh, I just played around making these. Uh, so this is essentially like a falling sand simulation using that bloody zombies blood, which here is, I guess, just water. But what's fascinating about this is like it's got a few different materials. So it's got fire, it's got smoke, uh, it's got sand and then the one thing that I was kind of like m most proud of this is it's got also like rigid body out so here is this is made out of iron so you can have it's not very interesting when it just falls down by itself like straight down uh, but you can kind of see it so here like I think this is wood which can be set on fire I don't know if this wood actually breaks. Oh yeah, the rock should be, you should be able to break the rock with, like if you put lava here. Anyway, this was, this was a, this is sort of a thing is kind of fun to play around with, but it's really hard to sort of make a game out of this, right? This is a kind of a fun toy to play around, but this is not re really a game. So, then the next step out of this was like, okay, I will try to make this into a, into put some sort of game mechanics into it to bring it out of the toy phase. So this is also back in 2011. And this was the sort of first test into that where you control a character. And so this is a two dimensional house. You could think of it where there are levels. And I think my original idea at this point was to make a game where uh, it would be like a 2D hitman type of a game. So you try to sneak into a building and murder the your target or whatever. And you could use sort of the physics of the world to do the murders. So you could uh, get a, like, shoot your gun and then the smoke would come out of it and it would set off the sprinkler system and then it would flood the floor with water and then you could do that above the target and then you could drill a hole and mer drown your target, like this sort of a thing. Uh, but this is already, like this prototype already kind of like told me what the problem w and the cool thing about this is. So the cool thing is all these emergent things can happen. So like here you can see all this water is going everywhere and you can see these floors will start to break and like if you break this thing, it'll fall down. and. What's the, uh, oh yeah, you can set things on fire. So that's all cool and sort of emergent things that happen here. 
and it looks really cool and fancy. But the problem is that if you let this thing, you know, hang around for a bit here, I will speed the process a little bit. You, you, will, you will quickly realize what the problem is if you're trying to do levels here. So this is the sort of end state of all of these. Is, is this sort of like the whole building will just like end up collapsing. So now you kind of like this is cool in a way, but like you can also like imagine like okay if I have to build a game around this, how how are you going to do like level design? How are you going to have any like it's all going to be a pile at the at the bottom of the screen all the time? So that and that that's I would say the main problem from sort of game design perspective of making of Noita has been that this engine allows for a lot of emergent things to happen but when you're designing things you always think of the emergent things as like all these all these cool things that will happen when the player does them but you don't also realize that the emergent stuff also comes in this sort of negative form and package and when you're thinking of how things will play out you will often just imagine the cool parts and forget that there's all these nasty negative side effects to things until you've like implemented them and then sort of tested and tried to figure out how what works. Uh, so then I guess the other game based on this was I, I tried to make this at a game jam was so uh, okay if everything collapses what if everything collapsing is the game mechanic. So here you're trying to make like houses collapse. So like this is you have materials and damages I have to remember what the keys are play this thing all right oh yeah so you can put explosives and the explosive costs a certain amount of money and you can put I think gunpowder here and then your idea is to get the building to collapse as much as possible so then you set things up and explode everything Okay, this didn't explode as nicely as I would have hoped. Let's just put more explosives. Well, it collapsed, finally. Uh, and that was kind of okay, but it was still like not quite, I feel like, taking advantage of the the thing. So then, Back in 2012, I thought about, okay, I will give this another go, and I asked Arvi to come and help me to do some pixel art. So this is when me and Arvi got together and we started, uh, tried to make this game, which is closer to what, what Noita sort of ended up being. Uh, so this is a rope-like permanent game and you play as this wizard character and you can cast spells and I don't know if you can see but in here you have the four elements and I'm gonna die here goddamn frogs so anyway the way it works is you can cast the spell type in the four elements and then it will do those as a spell so for example if I do water and fire it'll cast water to fire here wherever it hits so like here you can see it converts those into into fire then you can do air to fire and it should just conjure up a bunch of fire there but you can do also like air fire air so fire air is smoke so now fire oh no i died let's let's try that again Oh no, we got an ice world that's melting all the time. <laughs> uh, let me try. And well, you get the you get the general idea. Uh, oh no, I'm gonna drown in here. Uh, water to air, water to air. <laughs> 
So this was ki this was kind of fun to mess around in this game. Uh, let's see if we got okay. So everything's made out of wet wood here. So this is maybe a better case. So if you do like air to water, and now it's going to conjure up a bunch of water. If you do uh, water to air, now it's going to the water is going to disappear. But the thing I was trying to demonstrate is you can do more complicated things. So water fire is alcohol. Uh, so you can do air to water fire, which would conjure up some alcohol. And it would also do the other things. So like, you know, this sort of a thing. This was it, it was kind of fun uh, to play around when, with this. But it's also like, it's a bit Magicka inspired and it has sort of Magicka rela related problems is once you kind of like figure it out, like if, it, if I do air to, uh, so like if you figure out a good spell to kind of like work, you could just like spam that and beat the game with it. And realized what were what was the, like the best optimal spell to do. You you were kind of like very very much stuck in this game, and you couldn't kind of like <laughs> like this sort of a thing. Uh, and so while that had sort sort of some sort of promise, it was also like it had a lot of issues and problems. And this was around the time that only kind of saw this and he was kind of like, oh, that looks kind of cool, but it's got issues. And Oli was working on the swapper at the point. So he was trying to finish up the swapper and me and Arvi were kind of like playing around with it, trying to figure out what to do. So based on this prototype, problems and kind of cool so My microphone is bugging out, I assume. Yeah. yeah, I will swap microphones here because I think this is not working all that well. Let's see if I can get rid of this thing without messing up my hair, which I think is going to be much more difficult than I assume it is. <laughs> I think I got it. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's it is underneath my shirt. You have to go. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Okay. And so the issues and the problems were with that is while it was cool to have like a character in there and casting spells, that was also like the part that made it sort of unplayable because you could very easily die to sort of a physics glitch that you didn't quite understand why it happened or you could die because you didn't understand how the spell system, casting system kind of worked. So then we figured out that, okay, what if we try not having a character or avatar in the world? So we sort of made this uh, god game version where you kind of so this is this is like 2D populace. All right, this is the older version. So you could like conjure up some dirt here essentially. And then your characters would build things. Uh, I think I have a better prototype of this. If this boots up. Okay. Here, you had a bunch of villagers, and then you can kind of do these spells that are up here. So you can raise the ground or lower the ground, and you can see the your worshippers, they get all excited when you do magic spells near them, and they start worshipping you more. Then you can build houses to them, like this. You can make them, so now they will build a house Hopefully. Uh, maybe we will 
Yeah, I think there's some sort of a bug. I don't know why I can't build multiple houses. But you need more peasants for, for the rest of these, so I'm just going to cheat and bring more peasants. Oh, yeah, and in, in case you didn't notice, the peasants also pee when they get too excited, which is... <laughs> and the urine was obviously simulated, so it feeds back into the ecosystem. Uh, this is a very important feature. Let me get some more peasants here. So once you had enough peasants, you could do all these other spells. So like here, you can conjure up a rain. It's going to be very dark and you're not going to be able to see much. But you can also like see how it it's like sort of simulated here and forms into these ditches. Then you get to cast these more powerful spells, which is like lightning spell. And this is like the best part about the game is like shooting these dudes and seeing them being set on fire and the burning corpses. Oh yeah, could you actually pick these up as well? Is that, is that, oh yeah. You can take their burning corpses and hit them with them. <laughs> so this is, this is like, oh no, now I'm out of peasants. I have to spam more peasants. Let's just, So while this was kind of fun, uh, you'd kind of see what was the most fun part about this, which was essentially the lightning spell and killing your peasants, and the sort of constructing and trying to like maintain this world was kind of much more boring. Uh, so then, so what ended up happening here is in the previous prototypes where you had an actual avatar in the game, you could sort of feel the game world affecting you in a way, and that was like that was both the good and the bad about those things, right? Because it was annoying to die out of not understanding why you would die, but it was also like made it much more much more like there. Here in the sort of God game version, the while the simulation was kind of cool, it sort of just became a special effect. Right, it didn't actually affect the gameplay in any way. So then we sort of went back into having an avatar, and this is, we made a couple of different prototypes. This is probably not the one that Oli made, but Oli made a one where you kind of, well, had like sold that style controls. So this is in it. So in here, let me see. Here you could kind of like dig around, uh, so you can see. Apparently very effectively. And once you actually duck around enough, you could, can I get out of here? You would also sort of like collect the materials. So this is like Terraria-esque. So then once you've collected the materials, you could kind of like put them back into the world. And we sort of played around with this, and it was kind of like going in this Terraria direction. But as you can see, the problem with doing this pixel-based is that it's, this is way too fine to actually build anything but like a dirt mountain. And so this is around the time we kind of like figured that okay we'll just like try and make this sort of work and then we tried different ways of making the building w stuff work but it didn't quite come together and then we made a couple of different sort of roguelike-ish prototypes and kept working on it and this is what we had in 2017 so this is like much more closer to the what Noita is today, if this thing boots up.
Okay, so here you can see we've gone back into a sort of a wizard character. And you can kind of see this is looking much more familiar as an environment. But this was also, I think, still much more of a freeform game. So the world is like this huge place. So let me see if I can, can I start a new game? So the, I think the one thing we don't really have a good prototype here for, or a separate state is, we sort of had, oh my god, how am I going to play this with one hand? Oh yeah, I'm just going to die here. Something happened. Yeah. I assumed correctly. Uh, let's see if I can show the differences here. So what we had is, uh, so this is a weird version that I found of the game uh, where we had, we experimented with having, uh, in roguelikes you have identified items. So we experimented with having Un, uh, like you had to identify all the spells that you used. So like here, once I shoot, you can see these are kind of like the same standard things that you kind of start with. Uh, you could still dig around a bunch in here, like in that earlier version. So it's much more Terraria-esque in that fashion. But you don't actually collect any materials, so you just use that to kind of maneuver around. And then one of the mechanics that is kind of still in the game is, is uh, you had blood, and you could drink blood to heal yourself. And that's that's still in the game in in a sort of a hidden fashion. Let me see if I can get. Oh, there's a magic wand here. This is the different materials have different densities, so it takes a while to get through them. So let's see, what is this? I have no idea what this does. Oh, it shoots the, shoots the lime, slime balls. So in this version, you can kind of modify your wands wherever you want. So like you can kind of do this to get your rapid fire thing going. Oh god. This is really hard playing this one handed. And this is also so because you could get your health back up here, for example, if I murder that dude or these dudes. I have to switch to my drill here. Let me see. So use the drill on the bodies to get the blood out, and then you can drink the blood to heal yourself. So because of that, the game was also like much harder. So we compensated for you being able to heal things by having a much harder game. A homing orb, that's interesting. Let's see if we can pick this. I think I'm going to die if I pick this up. No? I survived. So let's see what this does. Shoots weird. So essentially, this this is the version of the game that was that is, I would say, kind of very close to what ended up being Noita. The biggest changes between this and the actual final release of the game is we kind of structured the game into these segments where you can only edit your wands in between 
uh, and we took the blood mechanic out of there. And that's essentially like this, this was like, as you can kind of see, it was a very iterative process of like testing everything out and trying to figure out like how to make a good game that actually uses this physics engine, which is much more of a difficult thing to do than you would maybe think from the final product. Okay, I think that's my time, and next up, Oli's gonna tell you a little bit more about how the physics stuff works. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, how the simulation actually works, but my presentation is only 10 minutes because that was the original idea of having a few short presentations. Uh, so it's not gonna go too much into any details. Uh, but this uh, falling sand simulation is quite an old idea and there was a game in the 90s called Wings that had it, and apparently there was a Scorched Earth also before it that had it. And I don't even know what is the first game to do this kind of thing. Uh, but Wikipedia tells us that it was 2005, uh, and that was when we had a few browser-based games that uh, like had a falling sand sandbox thing, not really much any gameplay, but that uh, Anyway, use the same kind of idea for a fun toy kind of thing. But anyway, uh, so here we have this empty grid, which is usually the kind of basic, uh, uh, you could call it unit of simulation here, like having this one grid cell. Uh, and we have some ground uh, here. And at the moment, there is nothing happening in the simulation because we have no rules. So we have some sand like on, on the ground and some sand that's only like floating up in the air. And to make things a bit more interesting, we will add one rule. That is that the sand goes down if there is nothing under it. And by following that rule, we get a pixel that falls down. And it falls down until it hits the ground. And now it's not able to go downwards anymore, apparently. So it settles here. And then we add another pixel and apply the same rules to this. And what happens is that we get this sort of tower of sand. And that's not really how sand behaves in the real world. So we have to add some more rules. And if a pixel can't go downwards, then it sort of goes to the sides and by applying this rule we get sand that actually moves in quite sand like ways so we get this nice nice tower of sand here and that is basically everything you need to have a basic falling sand simulation and Let's see next uh, what we need to actually simulate also water. So water is basically just like sand, but it's a bit more flowy. So it it is able to flow forward on surfaces that are flat and so on. But the first rule for water is also that it, it goes downwards. But if it is not able to go downwards, then water is also able to go to the sides like this. And in this case, the water decides to go to the left. And then it's not able to go downwards, so it goes to the left again. And, and in here, apparently, it's able to fall downwards, so it settles here. And yeah, here it can't move anymore. So that's it for this water. And there are a couple of things 
uh, that you have to do in a simulation like this to actually make it work. And I'm not gonna go too much into dirty details, uh, but one of these things is that uh, you have to simulate basically from, from downwards to the up, because otherwise you get pixels that haven't been simulated yet blocking the pixels above them. So here we basically, during one update step, in Noida the simulation sort of goes in different directions per one row in the pixel grid, like this basically. Uh, but then, to uh, make it look more natural, on the next update step, we have to go into a different direction. So, in the last frame, we were going from the, from the left to the right, and now we are going from right to the left. And also, you sort of would have to keep track of which, which pixels have already been updated or Otherwise, you get weird teleporting behavior and other glitches. But that's basically everything. If you explained very abstractly everything you have to do to do a very basic falling sand simulation with a couple of materials. But then in Noita, we do a couple of other things. Like Petri said, we also have rigid bodies. And to do that, we use a physics engine called Box2D. I don't know how many of you are programmers here. Is anyone? OK, there are some in the back and in the front. They are, so you might have heard of Box2D. It's very popular, used by games like Angry Birds and basically every game made by Petri. So to get the Box2D simulation going, Noita creates this sort of uh, shapes for these pixels that we have in the game. And then it runs the Box2D simulation for the shapes. So we have this sort of rock here, and rocks normally fall down. So we apply the simulation to the rock and see where it goes. And then basically the rock pixels aren't simulated at all using the falling sand mechanics, but Instead, they just follow the rigid body in the Box2D simulation. So in this case, this rock falls down, and it would also probably uh, stumble a bit on the ground. But to make things simpler, it just settles down here in this very natural position. And to make it look a bit nicer, you could also throw up some particles like this. And then, because we still have the falling sand simulation, we have to do something with the pixels that are simulated by that, that interact with the simula sim pixels simulated by the uh, Box2D engine. And basically, the very basic rule is that uh, if we have uh, these rock pixels here, and there is some water, the water is blocked by the rock pixels. It is actually a lot more complicated, but uh, you have to watch Petri's GDC presentation about this. I think he talks a bit more about the details in there. And then the, to actually get this thing to run in a big scale, like in Noida, you have to do lots of multi-threading and stuff like that. But I don't have that uh, in my slides here because, yeah, because that's that's complicated. But yeah, you could also use a thing called position-based dynamics and shape matching to do this kind of simulation, but that's not with what we did in Noita. And uh, I don't know if there are any falling sand games using this, but that, that would allow some things in the simulation that aren't that easy to do using Box2D. And there, there's another thing that I have not seen done in any other Falling Sun game. Uh, and that is basically having audio for the pixels. And to do that, uh, we run a quite simple algorithm that uh, tries to estimate 
where the sound of water, for example, in this case, is playing in the scene. It doesn't play a separate water sound for every, pix every pixel in the simulation. Instead, there is just like one water sound playing in the whole simulation. And to actually figure out how and where the sound should play, we sort of like take the estimate of the, uh, or like calculate the average of the positions of all the pixels in the simulation. The math is kind of simple and I don't know if my math notation is correct at all. Maybe people in the engineering school know about that. But uh, anyway, so when we average the positions of these pixels, we get sort of this, uh, this location here, that is the place where the sound should play. And then we also average the velocity, or take the sum of all the velocities of the pixels, and that tell us, tells us how loud the sound should be. And in this case, it's like uh, 2.5. And then we have this audio thing that like uh, it, it can play the sound of no water flowing or the sound of big waterfall and anything in between. And we give those numbers to it and then we get some sound out of it. And when you make a falling sound game, uh, there are some other materials you could add, like uh, in Noida we have lots of lava and acid and things like fire. And basically all these things are simulated using similar l rules that I explained. And fire has some, fire, fire is able to spread around and gas is basically like water, but it goes in the different direction and so on. But yeah, uh, I guess that was my short, I don't know what's gonna, presentation on this thing. Okay. I wanted to go to the first slide uh, because that is about Arvi's game, but I don't think, is Arvi here yet? So, okay. Okay, so I guess we have to wait for Arvi. Uh, is there somebody who wants to come play Noita? Because I, I don't want to play it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, come here. Do you want to play the old version or the new version? <laughs> I don't know. The new version. New version. Do you want a random version? <laughs> Let's go with random. Random version. I don't know what this one is. This is this is some random version from some random folder. Oh yeah, it's the it's the old one. Best of luck. <laughs> Do we have any do we have any sounds here in this version? I don't think so. Okay. Maybe we should play the new one next. Okay. So do you know the controls? No. Okay. It's uh, basically the mouse and the uh, key and the number. Yeah, hit I to open the menu. And I, I recommend the, yeah, that's, that's, 
probably going to murder you, but... <laughs> You can also, like, if you hold down in blood, you can drink the blood. Watch out, there's someone on, on your left. There's also, like, there, the green stuff on top of that. Now it is all in my inventory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's some un unidentified spells, which I assume will murder you. <laughs> so the reason we got rid of this unidentified thing is it was kind of... Oh, that those are pretty good. It was just very tedious. Oh, yeah, there's other tedious things about in this version, by the way. Okay. Uh... Sure. Uh, it seems that the, some of the pixels have kind of gravity, so they are not like strictly just the same simulation, uh, or, or they seem to have kind of different velocities, or do I see it right? Yes, that is actually correct. Uh, pixels have velocities, but it's using uh, the same system of falling sand, but it's also tracking so, so back in the day, the way it was done is you used your VGA buffer, right? You had a buffer on the on the computer that was a memory address, which corresponded to the pixels on the screen. So this was back in the DOS days. So then, what you would do is you the way you would mark things is you would just say that this color, so the yellow yellow color, which is let's say the color 14, uh, you did pretty well. <laughs> So I don't know, is, is this a panel question, or should I explain it? Or, Oli, do you want to explain? Uh, what? <laughs> so, so the way it used to be done is, is uh, you just read the color of the pixel and use that as the rules of like if something should move down. But because you can't sort of, these days you don't actually even have that good of an access to the buffer, so you have to have a separate buffer on, on your memory, and then you send that over to a texture, and then you render the texture. So the way we're doing it is we have a data structure which is similar, but instead of using a color, there's a lot more data in there for every pixel. So it, it tra keeps the velocity of things in there and the type of the material. So then you do the sa same simulation but you use those velocity numbers, so you, the pixel can move more than one pixel per frame. So the speed of light is more than one <laughs> pixel, and I think the speed of light is maybe f f five pixels. Yeah. Are you rendering all? Of, all? Yeah. <laughs> Are we? Oh, okay. Are you rendering all of the uh, pixels in the, in the viewport at the same time? Or do you, do you have like tiles? How, how does it work? Yes. Should we? Is, is this the panel time already? Should we get? You can use the time as you wish. As as we wish. We really? Okay. Can I play Spelunky? Yes. Oh. <laughs> no. One has Spelunky. Yes. Uh. So. I don't know if we have any any good way. You can st <laughs> we can all come up here. So are we really waiting just for RV and killing time? Is that the plan? Yeah. Okay. That sounds exciting.
so so the way it's it's done in in Noita is it uh, has a buffer that's about the size of the screen, and that's what's rendered every frame essentially. And so instead of like, but it keeps in the memory a bunch of other chunks of the world. And these chunks that it keeps in the memory, they're 512 by 512, and it keeps 12 of those around. And it, when you're moving around in the world, it's using the procedural generation to generate new 512, 512 chunks. So RV is here, so we don't have, let's give a big round of hand for RV. Coming to rescue us from this presentation. <laughs> that was your problem? So uh, have you slept at all? <laughs> On the plane? <laughs> Maybe a little bit, but not, not enough. That, that is the way of the game developer life. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's better if it doesn't. <laughs> so, so anyway, it, it's generating 512, 512 chunks as you move around in the world, and then it's once you once there's more than 12 of those in the memory, it'll take the one that's the furthest away from you and it'll write it to the disk. And then if you go back to it, it reads it from the disk. And that's essentially how it how it works. And those 512, 512 chunks of the world are subdivided into 64, 64 areas of things, and it'll keep track of which of those 64, 64 areas it has to update for the physics simulation. So it's keeping these sort of dirty rects of things in the memory. Do you have more, you have more questions? Does it work? Okay, so it, it basically uh, you you let one chunk burning, just burning wood or whatever, and you go you go to another place, so that that chunk is not in the viewport. Will w when you come back, will that chunk be already burned, or will it be burning in the last way you left it? I don't know if that's clear. Yeah, it'll. So what it'll do is it'll keep twelve of those, and it'll write them at that state that they are onto the disk, and once it loads, it just loads them back in that state that it wrote them. Oh, okay. So essentially, like if you set something uh, like a huge fire going somewhere, and you would go far enough away, it would save that, that it, everything's burning, and then when it loads it up, you come back, it's still sort of burning. Oh, okay. But the uh, 12 of those is, rather big enough to keep keep sort of a simulation of that happening. So like you have to go pretty far away from it, first of all, for it to kind of like be written to the disk. And so in most scenarios, it'll reach some sort of semi-stable state. And you don't sort of notice that, okay, this was like not here when I wasn't here. In most cases, in the most extreme cases, you can kind of see like if you're really like if you're really looking for it and paying attention, you can kind of realize that okay, this has been not simulated while I was here. Okay, so we have Arvi is giving us this. Uh, I assume I will be speaking to this red microphone. Yes. Okay. Uh, I have. In my backpack here, I have a laptop which has a presentation I made. Uh, and because I'm not going to show you any of my slides because they are made in Arial, and Arial is the one of those cursed fonts, I'll just open it for myself here so that I can use it as a reference. I have a new gamer laptop that I bought 
at the discount and it opens really quickly, so I won't be taking more of your time with me being late. Let's see. Okay, let's put it on the official spot. Well, I'm actually giving a presentation sitting down. This is the this is the first for me. All right, so uh, I was I was going to talk about the magical wands in Noita, the kind of uh, wand crafting, spell crafting system we built. Uh, I guess uh, I'm not sure if Petri and Oli uh, mentioned anything about who they are, what 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 is it that they do, uh, but. I'm kind of the non-programmer part of the team. My deal when making the game has been mainly to first uh, to do pixel art. That is what I officially signed for uh, about seven years ago. And after that, it's been kind of growing to design and handling XML files, for example, all the enemies and uh, a lot of the kind of spell-related things are XML files. And then also Lua scripting, which is also used heavily in the magical spells. And uh, unfortunately, because I, as mentioned, I was late because I misunderstood the London metro system. Uh, I'm not sure how much Petri and Oli have been uh, mentioning, uh, talking about the, the spells or the wands, but just as a kind of a very quick, quick notice, the game has these magical wands with different statistics. They have different rates of fire, different recharging times, different mana usages and mana recharge rates and so on. And then it has, on top of those magical spells, which you can put into these magical wands, and these spells kind of dictate what the wands do when you use them. And uh, if this sounds a little bit like, yeah, okay, if this sounds a little bit like uh, guns with bullets to you, if there's some kind of a similarity, uh, you are in luck because uh, originally I think Petri suggested the, this idea of. Uh, in, I think, maybe 2014, where, hey, we have a game we, which obviously has guns. We had guns like handguns and desert eagles and whatever. And Petri suggested, what if these guns actually work like decks of cards? And you draw cards from the deck, and those cards dictate uh, what happens when you shoot a gun. Uh, eventually, these guns changed into magical ones because the kind of themes of the game uh, got boiled down, and we get a better idea of what we wanted to do with the game theme-wise. Uh, but this idea of decks of cards uh, that dictate what happens was something that sounded pretty cool, and we decided to prototype it. I'm pretty sure it might have been summer 2014. Uh, it, it kind of immediately offered some ideas for what, of, what kind of cards we could do. We could have obviously bullets, like actual spells that deal damage. We could also have modifiers that kind of change what happens, what the qualities of those bullets are. Uh, we could have, like, there, there were a lot of different ideas that we built on. Originally, there were also, like, spells that were not beneficial, some kind of backfire system where maybe you would have to put some kind of bad spells into the magical ones or the guns or whatever and uh, you would have to deal with the negative effects to get some kind of a positive. There are a lot, a lot of ideas you could build, build out of that. So we made a prototype, and the prototype felt pretty fun. Originally, it was kind of maybe detached from this physics-based thing that was very crucial for the game. Uh, but since it was kind of fun, just fun to use, it felt interesting, we decided to keep it, uh, or at least we decided not to remove it. And uh, over time, as the game took form and we kind of settled down on the on the systems, even up slowly over time, we got to the point where we could also implement this kind of, for example, magical spells that deal with the physics of the game. For example, one of the first spells you get when you start the game, you have this bomb, which is actually a physical object that Im directly destroys the game world, which is, yeah, or and uh, lights things on fire. So that is a very concrete example of this spell system uh, kind of showcasing the also the physics which we wanted and uh, so yeah this one crafting system I just listed a couple of things that I at least I personally found neat about it that and I think we might have discussed it as a team that we 
uh, most of us found these things neat, or even all of us. Uh, first of all, it's a very complex and deep system because you have this. You can put these spells in the, into the ones. You have spells that affect other spells. Uh, we also devised this system of some ones having shuffle, where the kind of cards or spells it draws is randomized in order. So you cannot cannot kind of make intentional combos, but instead you can you have to rely on probability. But also there would be ones that do not shuffle. You can design the order in which the spells are cast from the wand, uh, which allows for a lot of kind of combo potential and stuff. So the wand system immediately seemed very fruitful for th for this kind of a kind of a deep learning curve, but still very satisfying system where you can start with very simple, this wand casts a fireball, that's it. And then later on you can have this wand casts a homing fireball, and when it hits a wall it casts eight exploding deers in random directions, and those deers are leaking acid, that kind of stuff. So it seemed uh, like a very cool, cool system. Uh, obviously, once we moved away from guns to the magical ones, uh, it also added a lot to the kind of magical, alchemical theme of the game, which is ob obviously a good thing for us. Uh, yeah, I also al already mentioned that later on there was the physics system integration and uh, with these spells, you can also, even if you don't know what you're doing, when you're just learning, you can make a wand, put some r spells in it, cast it, po possibly die, because you didn't know that the spells would be very detrimental for yourself. But the, this kind of experimentation also benefited the physics part of the game, because you could see that, okay, I have a spell called Nuke. That I can kind of imagine what that might do. I will cast it. It exploded very hard because that is what those kinds of things often do in games, especially uh, Finnish games from the 90s. And then you die because of the explosion, and then okay, well that's that might be interesting. Uh, and uh, it showcased that you can see things falling down. The physics are doing their job, so that's uh, part of the system's strengths. And. Uh, Oh yeah, and also it, it also allows a lot for us because we spend a lot of time wondering what kind of uh, items we could have, what kind of things the player has to find in the game world. What is the reason why the player is exploring the game world? I, this might not have been something that we kind of consciously spend a lot of time, time uh, considering, or we might have, I don't remember anymore. But in the end, these spells are something you can collect in the game world that are all related into the same singular system. So we didn't have to kind of we didn't have to implement armor, different kind of weapons, different kinds of like a we could have this single category of items inside which we could have a lot of like tons of variety. I think there are like 250 spells in the game right now. So that was also a very nice thing because uh, it could be easy to bloat the game with too many different categories of items. And in the end, we actually had a very small amount of categories. And obviously, it's also fun for us as developers to see what the players get up to, because the players get up to a lot of stuff. Uh, then there were some problems with this one crafting system. Uh, obviously, the balance was a big thing. How do we prevent certain cards from being like way too good? How do we guarantee that the players actually experiment with the game? We tried cards or spells that have limited uses that you have to use them only a several couple of times. They are so powerful, and then you have to throw them away and use uh, new cards. Uh, we tried limiting where cards spawn, so when you get later into the game, you get better guards, so on. Uh, then there was also the problem of how to present the cards. Obviously, this idea of guns as decks of cards turned into magical ones was maybe the most intuitive system, so we wanted to uh, figure out something that would make it more plausible in-world. We tried making the spells, uh, or like pieces of bones, different runes, uh, magical gems, things like that. There was a lo lot of options to go for. Uh, same for the user interface, obviously, kind of related to that. And uh, also, just like many kinds of design things, just starting from, if we have these items, I guess we have need an inventory. What kind of an inv inventory do we have? What kind of inventory space we have? Those are just kind of game design things related to this system. It was because it was kind of this own separate thing, thing from everything else. Uh, it had a lot of these design problems that we kind of had to solve separately or not solve separately that didn't really touch 
the rest of the game but were still very important. Uh, also, in the end, even right now, we still haven't fully figured out how the player should realize the depth of this system, how to teach the player how the one system works. There's a, in many of these, there's also like different viewpoints to take. Uh, you could e either say that, okay, it's cool if the player has to learn it all just by trying, which, which can be cool but also frustrating, or we could have a tutorial which so shows the player that, hey, you do it this way, which could be helpful, but more limiting or more kind of less mysterious, less interesting. So eh. over time, we solved some of these problems. Uh, for example, we realized that if the player can refresh those spells with limited uses every now and then, then because you never lose those spells completely, you can use them eventually, but you just have to wait for that refresh, uh, the kind of uh, frustration of losing spells forever went away, so this limiting powerful spells by making them have limited uses kind of solved itself over time, and it was a very long process of being solved. And so we kind of found some solutions. Sometimes we had to do compromises. We had to discuss things for a very long time between the three of us. All, of, all three of us had different opinions, different viewpoints. Uh, sometimes we won't found compromises. Some, sometimes we just left things the way they were at a certain point and then never looked at it again and went to early access with that design. And it worked pretty well. People have been pretty happy with the game. I'm, I, I can't really complain about that, that system either. And sometimes we also just kind of tried different systems. For example, for this limited use system, we tried uh, making everything uh, last forever, which had the problems I mentioned earlier. Then we tried making everything have limited uses, so that, is th so that you have to kind of shuffle your spells very often, even for the like very basic damage dealing spells. And it had some other problems, some other strengths. So this kind of iterative design eventually led to the magical wand system we have now. And right now things are pr looking pretty good. We have a uh, many different kind of magical wands. I actually sp spoke more about the spells instead of the wands, but the Spells are more interesting to me than the ones because the ones are kind of the vehicle for the spells and the sp magical ones on their own, they are just a clump of stats that affect speed or recharge them and so on. So the spells are kind of the main star of the show here. But right now we have a lot of spells. We have this kind of wand spawning system. There are still those, some issues that we might want to look at, but since the game is in early access, that's obviously uh, uh, like we have the power of returning to those things that we left one way or, ano or another when we went to early access and changed them. Obviously, some players are going to be disappointed because some people have, have really deep understanding of the system right now. But as game designers, I guess we have, we have to take the risk of someone being annoyed about our shenanigans. But yeah, I guess that's the nutshell of the one system of the game. Thank you. We have a panel. So uh, I guess we continue a panel. Or continue our panel. Yeah. yeah. I hope you didn't have to continue the panel for a very long time, just the two of us when I was uh, raising to <laughs> reach the design factory. All right, so we're setting up the panel. Because the actual game is only in the beginning. Okay. In the beginning, do you, if you have any onboarding to do. No. <laughs> we have the English and the sound and the sound effects. Yeah. Check, check. There's actually pretty low on volume, this low box on thingy. Volume. Well, 
Vaihdetaan sitä, koska Joo, se, se on käytävä. Tämä on vähän hassu. Joo, joo. Tota, haluatko sä? Käydään se siis. All right. I've been waiting for <laughs> having this question, so I'm happy to have guys here uh, to explore more on Noita and Nolla games also. So I kind of um, noticed that you didn't explain too much of your history. So I would like to start this panel so that you would a little bit explain of what you have done before and what are the exact roles. I know that it's a small studio, but what are the roles like? How, how is the dynamics of the roles within this small team? You've a little bit explained it, but a bit of your history, and then what do you do in this? A little bit of our history or a little bit of Nolla games? What kind of games did you do before Noita? Video <laughs> games. <laughs> Maybe a little bit more into detail. Which games? Uh, which games? Yep. Uh, I did. So, so the big one is crayon physics, the commercial game. Uh, if you if, do, you really want my whole video game history, or is it? So yeah. <laughs> Maybe selection, not like listing every one of them, but the yeah highlights. The, so uh, I. I uh, applied to an internship at Frozenbyte back in 2003, four, something like that. I got uh, I got into Frozenbyte and I was working there on Shadow Grounds. And while I was there, I kind of also started making prototypes on my own, inspired by the experimental gameplay workshop. And uh, I ended up making like these prototypes, one a month, essentially. And I made a bunch of those, and one of them was called Crayon Physics. Uh, one of them was the bloody zombies that I showed you. Uh, one of them was called Crayon Physics, and then the prototype proved popular enough, uh, and I didn't have anything else to do for that summer, uh, so I figured I will make a bigger version of it. And then the bigger version uh, got into the IGF, and won the grand prize at the Independent Games Festival. So then I figured I have to finish that and turn it into a commercial game, and that's sort of what I did, and that's, that's the... So Shadowgrounds is a pretty old game, and that was what, which year? I think it's Shadowgrounds, is it 2005? 2005. 2004? 2004, yeah, yeah. And then the IGF happened for you in 2009? Eight? What? Eight? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think so. 2004, 2005, yeah, something like that. Yeah, um, I guess I'm best known for a game called uh, This Whopper that I did with uh, Otto Hantula. Uh, I, I started working on this game when I was still in high school, but it was a secret to everyone because it wasn't very cool to make games. And then then I got to university and met Otto there, and then we started working on the prototype we had a, a bit more seriously. And uh, it was just a hobby for us, but we decided, okay, let's send it to some festivals. And we were surprised that it actually got to a few events. And then we were more surprised that it also won some awards there, probably because we were the youngest people in all the events. And then we decided to drop out of university, and I'm still a dropout. And Otto went back to the uni and finished his studies. And pretty soon after that game, I started actually working on Noita. So I, I haven't done that many games, not as many as Arvi has, as Arvi has done. <laughs> but yeah, I have done some prototypes that I'm not that proud of for different reasons. OK. Uh, so um, I started making games in primary school because uh, my cousin had a Super Nintendo and I enjoyed Super Mario World a lot and I wanted to make games. And in kindergarten, I drew games on paper. So uh, in primary school, a friend of mine is, was like, hey, do you want to make games? 
and they showed me Game Maker. I mean, we made a Space Invaders slash Pac-Man combination thing. And uh, eventually, partially because of the aforementioned it's not cool to make games thing, uh, my primary school mates who were interested in making games stopped making games over the like primary school and upper secondary and high school. Uh, but I, I kept making games because I was momentarily impervious to being ashamed. And uh, so it was, a, it was just a very enjoyable hobby. It was a very creative hobby. So I just kept making them without that much kind of monetary interest in them, uh, except until I saw Petri's crayon physics and it inspired me a lot. And uh, after that, when I noticed that, oh, there was this game called Crayon Physics that won the Independent Games Festival Award. I, it maybe kind of gave me some direction for what to aim for. So I just kept making games. And <laughs> in 2012, I think, Petri asked me if, if I wanted to make pixel art for a prototype that would eventually become Noita, that because Petri was submitting it to an event, and I accepted. And that's kind of how I originally got into this. But on the side, I kept making my own games under my own company. And I released my first commercial game in 2015 called Environmental Station Alpha. And then later in uh, this year, I released Baba Is You. So I guess I, it was kind of like a slow slip from making games for fun as a hobby into making them as my day job. And I, I didn't drop out of university, but it's, it's been close <laughs> for like four years now. But uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. You will graduate, hopefully. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to. Good, good. Um, so many people uh, kind of try to find people to work with games together. It's because many of us can't make games alone. So how did you guys meet? Or how did you choose each other? Or is this top secret um, <laughs> information? How did you actually end up being NOLA games together? Uh, should should we answer like uh, per person? Whichever of you wants to answer. <laughs> I guess I, I guess I could just because I already mentioned mostly how I ended up doing things. I noticed Petri's games, and when I moved to study to Helsinki, uh, Petri started organizing these indie beers every last Tuesday of every month. So there I kind of got to know both Olli and Petri which kind of made it possible that Petri could ask me to do pixel art for uh, his game. That's, that's pretty much it for me. And I, I guess we were sharing an office with Petri since 2011 or something. And then someday, I don't remember why, but Petri gave me access to the source code for this game. And then I did some things in the game and slowly somehow started working on it. It's a bit blurry, I don't know what actually happened, but yeah, things just happened. More clear view from Petri's side? Did you plan this all to be blurry? No, no, I have no memory of any of this. <laughs> no, I remember I um, played Spelunky at a lecture, and then there was some annoying young kid in the front row who was shitting on my Spelunky skills. And that was RV. And then I found out that RV's made has made some games that were, let's say, inspired by crayon physics. So RV, did you know about this uh, Spelunky addiction, so that you kind of used it, or was it just by coincidence? At that point, uh, because I had been really inspired by crayon physics, and I, I had indeed made, I think, two or three games inspired by crayon physics. Uh, Petri was kind of a, kind of this indie star that I looked up to, and I had a, the opportunity to go to assembly to watch Petri play Spelunky. And uh, because I wanted to be a cool kid, uh, I guess I gave some lip about <laughs> Petri playing Spelunky. I didn't, I didn't remember that this was a, like a turning point for our working relationship, but <laughs> that's uh, scary. Uh, I can also tell a small anecdote of meeting Arvi. Uh, so that was like, uh, I think I had seen an interview. Arvi was already quite indie fame at that point. 
and I had seen Arvi on some interview, and I was going to a game jam in Sweden, and then I saw Arvi on, on the airport and tried to awkwardly talk to him, and he was probably pretty creeped out. And then we went to the same hostel for because it was close to the jam, and we were probably the only Finns in there, and they had given us the same room in there. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, that sounds weird, but, then <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we slept on the jam side, I guess. So yeah, no. So also, game jams were had a part on on your history, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I just wanted to say that uh, I remember meeting at the airport, but I definitely didn't, didn't remember having the same room in the hotel. But I, I, I don't think it was. I don't remember sleeping in the room, and so yeah. <laughs> Well, that's a mystery for the ages. Okay, cool. Um, so, this was back in the day. You've been quite long doing um, uh, Noita. So, how long has the development of Noita actually now taken? Like, and how would you count it? Where did it start? Six months. <laughs> I don't... We, the, I'm waiting I, for another answer, yeah. So, I think... The three of us have worked on it more or less full time ish. I think from 2014 onwards, we the three of us have worked. I think as a team, if I remember correctly. Was that when Nola Games was born, or when did Nola Games was born? When did you? Nola, ga Nola Games is is 2016 November is. So essentially, we didn't have a. So the origins of like how me and Arvi started working on it was not all that serious. So we kind of played around and did this. And if something were to come out of it, we would like kind of figure it out. And that's how all, I think Oli also got in. Is like we were kind of like messing around and trying to see if we can kind of make a game. And then by the time we started kind of working on it full time, I think the general understanding was that we would set up a company for the game to make sure, because each of us has our own companies. Uh, so the idea was that we would set up a company for the game, but there was like no real reason to have a company for the game, except sort of the peace of mind for us that we'd, we'd share it properly. So then in 2016, we kind of like made the company because we have, had to, essentially. Yeah, I guess I guess we didn't plan to work on the game for so many years. So, yeah, it was it took like twice as long as probably any of us thought. I don't know about you. Yeah, uh, and to kind of clarify, originally I worked for Petri uh, as a kind of a uh, employee in Petri's company, and uh, and uh, Oli was kind of not employed by Petri's company, but instead because Petri and Oli were still sh sharing the same office space, it was kind of this un unofficial until 2016 working relationship where we kind of worked together, but where it wasn't super official. But just kind of, uh, I hope this is not something that Petri didn't want to mention, but I think I rem remember that the official story is that uh, some of the first bits of Noita were realized in 2006 or something like that in the form of the yeah, bloody zombies was apparently discussed earlier. So is in just kind of just to add that to the question because it was about the origins of Noita because it, I think it's pretty cool that in some level the game has been in the works for like six or seven years now, but in some level it has been like over 10 years. So it depends how you count and what is counted as the beginning of it. You know a lot of other indies, how kind of typical this kind of a story of taking this long to develop it and have such a kind of organic process to find each other? How typical it is in the indie scene? I have no idea. I just know that uh, if, you make an, if you make anything and you estimate that you will be done in time X, the eventual time will be possibly two times X or more. 
Uh, okay, 10 times X. Like, I've, I've, I know that some people have been able to make games very quickly, but no. It In comparison, how long Baba is you took? Uh, Baba is to you took exactly uh, two times as long as I originally planned, which is two years instead of a one year. I guess, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Oli, how long did uh, Swapper took uh, to develop? I think it was like four years or something, but it also took at least one year more than we planned. And then we just had to finish the game, basically. Yeah. Was there also that the idea was cooking up with uh, prototypes? Yes. It was first, first a multiplayer game and turned into a very, very different kind of game in the end. So you're currently on the Steam Early Access, correct? Uh, since the, the, this uh, autumn. So what has been the highlights of it and what have you learned and do you have a date for the launch? Uh, of the early access part of it. Yeah, what have you learned in the early access? Uh, like, has it been useful for you guys? Uh, at least for me personally. Personally, I know that Petri and Oli, because I've uh, like a. Okay, uh, maybe I should gather my thoughts instead of just saying something. Yeah. I can, I can say something. <laughs> yeah, okay, maybe Petri should, should start. I will say that we don't have an actual date. So that I, that's much. We, our original plan was for today, but then we got this lecture, so we had to reschedule the launch date, and now it's going to take probably 10 years more to get it done, so. Uh, sorry. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so for me personally, at least, uh, the kind of post-release uh, time frame has been very interesting, because it obviously we have had way more testers than ever before, because for early access, all the players are kind of testers. And people have been really enthusiastic about the game, and it's been very, very interesting. Obviously, we have learned about many bugs and many design viewpoints we might not have considered uh, just by us three. But for example, since I mentioned earlier that my job was is kind of making new spells for the game, it has also been interesting to be in, in this stage where we are not actively trying to polish everything as much as we can, but rather kind of returning to an earlier point of development where we can also consider new features and add, add those kinds of things. And, so, and it's been very refreshing to get player feedback, obviously fix things and polish things all the time, but also just be able to, we have a new update, we added new spells, we added new content, and the, that's a very refreshing thing to do. But it just. The reason why I had to gather my thoughts is that I know that Petri and Oli have been uh, more needed in fixing the bugs because I cannot program, and I'm, f I'm afraid that they have a kind of a different viewpoint to this post-early access release time frame. I don't know if you feel that way, but I'm just, I just wanted to add that disclaimer. I, I would say it's, it, it adds some nice reality checks for like how important things are actually so and it's been nicer than i thought so we have bugs but people aren't too angry about them so it's been okay yeah i don't it's it's been the most fun has been obviously to see that players have really enjoyed the game and played it a lot and figured out a lot of things about the game so far that I think it's been and they've done things that I don't think none of us would have expected them to do like I recently saw some crazy always cast earthquake wand that destroys the whole the big tree at the beginning so they managed to like evaporate it completely that was pretty crazy is that rewarding to see something that the players figure out themselves, or is it annoying? It's great. It's sometimes maybe scary, because as mentioned, like when you have a lot of people enthusiastic about the game, especially when some of them are extremely enthusiastic about the game. Uh, for example, there are some streamers who have been streaming the game quite a bit uh, after the release. So it's sometimes kind of bewildering to see how quickly people figure out 
figure things out, especially because uh, when we released the game, we had a kind of uh, hidden away the game files in more than, than just uh, having them in some folder somewhere. So there was like a time frame after the early access release where people couldn't just look up the just kind of d data mine every, all, all the changes we did. And even then, people were really quick on the uptake on kind of figuring out the lore and secrets. And uh, there are no secrets in the game, obviously, but like non-secrets of the game. Uh, and uh, to add to the to Petri's anecdote about this uh, wild wand that Petri recently saw, I also saw a post from someone who had started the game, played it for seven hours, taken it really slow and really careful, and actually beaten the game in seven hours, whereas most people play the game like 100, 200 times before they get, get a singular win, which is kind of cool. It's nice to see that the game is not, for example, unfair, so that if you even if you take things low, you might not win, but instead this player had just checked things out and been careful and won the game. That's cool. Walk us through a little bit. How does it work with uh, early access? What kind of, do you get some data out of it? Or uh, just following the streams? Do you get forum feedback? How do you actually know what players do? Uh, we mostly buy the data from Facebook, so we don't get like straight rate data from early access. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a joke. Uh, so uh, we we mostly use uh, forums and Discord chats. Uh, like uh, do you have there, your own there, Discord? There's a, there's a fun Discord, so okay. people discuss the game there. So we lurk in there and also watch some let's play some. At least that's how I get my view on how the game works. All right. Um, so one student wanted to know what is your favorite element or detail in the game, and I want to add to that also what's your pet peeve? What do you love and hate in your own creation? Each one of you. Okay. Uh, it's a, to be honest, I'm, I'm not hesitating because I cannot think of anything that I love about the game. It's more, more that I'm trying to think of like what are, what are my priorities what i what do i want to mention the most which is always a problem in these kinds of questions uh i guess i'd say that the thing that i enjoy the most about the game is uh what i talked about earlier the spells just kind of the fact that there's this relatively endless area of trying things out that actually allows for a lot of experimentation even if a spell idea is not very uh, useful if, if it's cool in some way or if it's fun to use it might be worthwhile to add to the game and if it's widely powerful there are many ways to try to balance that out or even not balance it out but find other ways to even things out so I would say that just kind of seeing people use new spells and being able to add new spells is my personal favorite at least right now and for a pet peeve uh, I've been very uh, very sad about the fact that when you move between areas, the kind of background art between the areas is just a straight line. We have we didn't have time to implement like a cool some kind of a effect because it's not very it's not a very high priority thing. You don't really as a player you you won't probably even notice this. Now I spilled it out, uh, but even if you do notice, it doesn't affect the gameplay. It's just an aest uh, aesthetical thing that I personally care about a lot. I would like to see some kind of a a jagged edge between areas. Mm. I, I guess I have the same answer for the first question. So it is very interesting to see what kind of new things people still discover in the game. And also, like, yeah. Yeah. Arvi said it better than I, I can say it. And my pet peeve, not in the game, but uh, it's like the compile times we have, they are way, way, way too slow. Uh, I, I think all my fav like favorite details are spoiler related. So I don't know if I should say them. One spoiler, maybe. One spoiler. Well, there's one thing that I don't think even has been discovered yet. 
but oh no, don't spoil that. that, that I can't. <laughs> but let's say the a hint. Chainsaw. It's my. Oh, maybe that's enough. Yeah. Chainsaw is my favorite, like sort of detail. That's okay. where you. <laughs> no, there's no lawnmower. No. And a pet peeve. Pet peeve. I think the compile times are is really is pretty nasty. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. Okay. So uh, we have one question from the stream uh, from Antiru Analyze. That what kind of design lessons have you had during the development? Like, what would you take out of this to the next production if you can take anything out? It's been a long time. Yeah, I, I would say that making a so there is there's different kinds of games you can kind of make. If you're making a systemic emergent game, the problem with it is that you need to all have kind of all the pieces in there in order to know if it works or not. And the part that you don't often realize when you're thinking about stuff is I would say that the emergent stuff will have like negative things attached to them. So when you're making highly systemic games, there's going to be nasty, unexpected things that will happen. And then there's really, like you can think about them beforehand, but like if you really want to have something that's emergent and fun for the player, if you can kind of like figure out all the details about it beforehand, it's not that emergent of a system for the players to play. So they will, and so then it'll just require more iteration and thinking and figuring out and fixing things too. How much did you test with friends or family or other kinds of testing before it was in the early access? Uh, we had a sort of a bunch of testers who played it. Few of them played it a lot, like hundreds of hours, and then we had some sort of a testing, we had a testing discord where we had people playing it. So we had a bunch of players who played it. Then we also had, from time to time, we, during the time, we brought up people to play it at the office. But do you, making this sort of a game that's like systemic roguelike type of a game, the problem with it is like if you bring someone to play it, they can maybe play it for an hour. But it might be that the actual real issues are 10 plus hours into the game, or like 50 plus hours into the game. So. When did you start bringing in testers? Like, was it like before early access, or just like years up before that? Yeah, I mean, we've we've sort of done it on semi on semi regular basis. We've had someone come to the office and play the game over the years. So, starting with the early prototypes and whatnot. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? Would you like to ask something? Do, uh, Arvi, do you want to add to that? Uh, In the meanwhile, you can think about your questions. I was just mentally preparing that we would all say one design thing, but I, I guess if that was not the intent of the question, then oh, we go can ahead. move on. Uh, I don't actually have a answer prepared. I was just kind of... <laughs> 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 I was just surprised that we didn't all <laughs> say something. So you, you were pr prepared to wing it? Uh, I was prepared to think about it. Okay, all right. <laughs> I, I pretty much believe that the emergency thing is just, emergence thing is such a big lesson to, to your guys in this game. But if you have something like minor details, which is no, not that challenging, because sometimes you learn something surprisingly simple to take away to the next one. Is there anything like that? Uh, like, why didn't I come up with that before? Yeah, okay, to, to be honest, even if, even if I said I didn't think of an answer, I can immediately say that using tools not meant for the purpose you're using them for is not a good idea if you make a game for six or so years. So using the pixel editor of an unrelated game creation tool to make sprite art for an actual commercial C++-based title will eventually leave you in a bad position. That is my personal Design lesson. lesson. Design. Yeah, it's, it's definitely design. Yeah. Okay, there is one question. How do we do? We have a mic for for that gentleman. 
I will not throw this, even though that's the original use of it. Yeah, so hello. Um, I'd like to ask you about uh, the marketing, because it seems like your game is a big hit now in early access. So did you have uh, any kind of marketing plan, and how did you get the game out there? I think this is maybe best answered by Petri and Oli, because they handled it way better than I did. OK. Uh, we didn't really have any plan. We just did things and saw if they worked. But yeah, we, we spent quite a lot of time making the trailers, for example. So, so we sort of tried to make them uh, describe what is cool about the game as well as is possible, and uh, spent more time doing that than is enjoyable. So yeah, that is at least one of the things that comes to mind. Yeah, I would I would say it's it's hard to have a good marketing plan for this sort of a game. So our our sort of general idea was that we looked at the game and figured out what is the one thing that is cool and unique about the game that no other game has, and that was like the physics engine stuff. So like if you actually play the game, the physics are a really big part of it, but like there's also like the whole, it's a roguelite, you're doing spells, you're editing the spells, you're making your own spells and whatnot, and that's like really big part of actually playing the game. But we figured out that, okay, the one thing that's unique and no one else is doing is that, let's say, every pixel is simulated is what we kind of like came up with. And so that's where we kind of like focused on. So we made a trailer and we thought about like, okay, let's make the trailer so that it shows the physics stuff and what's unique about the game. So if we get that across to people, then there's a chance that, and if people get excited about that, then they're, they're not gonna find another game that's like this. And uh, on top of this, there was some kind of practical things, just kind of, uh, having t testing different kinds of events and different kind of kinds of contacts on what kind of makes sense for the game's promotion I, and i think this is espe especially when uh most of the uh, duration of the development of the game i hadn't really made any commercial very successful games but petri and Oli had both uh, one like very commercially successful game so they had a lot of this kind of knowledge knowledge about like for example about the about what kind of an event is the independent games festival, for example, and like what to do about that. And that I think that kind of practical knowledge, it's not re very related to the game directly, but it, it feels very important, important because it's kind of, it may affect things if you have a nice trailer and if you can show the trailer in a nice place, then people might say that nice. Uh, but also I'd, I kind of want to highlight that uh, I feel that Oli worked pretty hard as a kind of a kind of a person taking care of of the quality of many of the assets of the game. For example, when it comes to, comes to the music, I think the the music that we used used in the original trailer of the game uh, made by From Grotto, who, Grotto, who ended up making the music for the final game, I'm pretty sure that was Oli's suggestion, and it gave the trailer a very unique atmosphere. And also, when it comes to many of the uh, audio and visual elements of the game, I, I think that Oli kind of made sure that they would look good for players and that uh, it would be hard to imagine that that didn't have an effect on how people viewed the game when they saw the trailers and so on. I think that you're uh, kind of, I would like to hear a little bit of how did you end up showcasing a game at GDC? Was it the de Day of the Devs or? Was it what is it called? The showcasing at GDC's lobby. Mm, yeah, I guess that was our first time with the game on the GDC, and then we also. W what year was that? Like two years ago? A uh, year ago? It was 2018. 2018. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, also one thing that wasn't mentioned that probably helped us quite a lot was that we had made some games before this one and had some contacts previously from previous like uh, game showcase rounds and so on. So it made the whole thing a lot easier for us and like allowed us to skip some parts of the marketing, basically.
Are you able to share us? How did you end up to the showcase? Uh, we knew the right people. Okay, all right, cool. <laughs> well, it, it's really, for Day of the Devs, it, it was like after we put the trailer out, and that was in 2017, the summer, after we put the trailer out, the trailer did pretty well, and we got a lot of contacts. So people from the Day of the Devs, they saw the trailer, and they were like, hey, would you be interested in showcasing the game? And they originally wanted us, I think, for October 2017. And that was, we said, like, well, it's not necessarily quite so good, but we skipped that. And then they asked, well, would you like to do GDC? And then it was like, sure. How, how did you share your trailer? Was it like, how did you spread it out? Was it that people are following you, so they kind of picked it up? Or did you do something specifically to get your trailer spread? Uh, we put it on YouTube. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm pulling you, more. <laughs> yeah, okay, if cool. you want, I, I can give a better answer of what, but I don't know if it's that useful because it was very specific to our situation. Sure. Uh, what we did is we announced that we have a, so we first announced, I think, month prior to it that we have a company. So we announced that there is this new company, Nola Games, and it's made by the three of us who've made games before. And we sort of tried sending that to all the press people we knew to get see if there was any interest, and there wasn't all that much. In, I mean, some people noticed it. Then we posted specifically made from the like a teaser from the that you showcased the game engine, uh, and it, I think it featured the name of the company, so that was kind of related to it. So we had like this trailer that showed it. And then we tried to gather some people who would be interested from that. And then I think we announced it beforehand that next week we're going to announce the trailer and try to get people like who would be potentially interested, get their email addresses and whatnot. And then we, when it came time to it, we emailed everyone we kind of had been in contact with that, okay, we have the trailer is out now, this is the game. And then we posted it onto all possible places that we could figure where you could essentially post about the trailer. I think that already sounds pretty useful to know how this worked. Yeah. Sure, yeah. but it's, it's, <laughs> it was very specific, I guess, to our yeah. case, because to some extent, <clears throat> some extent we had some contacts that we could yeah. email. Sure. So Mika is our teacher here at Aalto and playing the game for a while now. <laughs> so do you have any comments or questions? I should always play this on stream because I usually never get this far. <laughs> I'm actually doing ridiculously well. Uh, but yeah, one little uh, question about, we already talked a bit about the physics, but you have this, some of the part in the world that is, that is not affected by the physics, like the stuff that's kind of attached to the wall, so to say. So I've noticed sometimes you get stuck in this one pixel style things, is there some technical reason why you couldn't switch between these? Because that would sometimes feel like if you had like one pixel, it would be good to kind of change it to actually fall down or something like that. Have you considered that? Did you know this? Yes. Yes, we're aware of this. Uh, so there is... Uh, so, so the technical reason for it is it's a bit CPU expensive to go looking for these, but that's not really necessarily that big of a problem. The game design wise, the problem there is like you can actually go through single pixel things that are by themselves as a character. The game design wise, the problem is that if, if we could make them crumble down is a potential that we could do. We could detect where they are, they could kind of fall down and maybe we will eventually do that. The potential issue there is you as a player kind of sometimes may rely on some small pixels, right? So you assume these pixels will hold, and once you kind of know, you know, like, okay, I can stand on this. So if, if the case is that you will go on those and they will fall down and then you fall down, then you will sort of very likely can end up dying in that case, and then it feels unfair that there's like this thing that... Excellent. Uh, we are going over time, but I want to ask one more question since, it, since this is games now. Is there some kind of a trend that you're now following? Are you eager to go to the next production, either with your own companies or together, that you know you could share with us? 
ideas or trends or things that are not related to Noida, but maybe related to your future? DOS games? Um, eventually finishing my studies, I guess. Finishing Noida. <laughs> All right, so we don't really get any, <laughs> any of that, but maybe during the discussions at the coffee, we have some coffee, I presume, there. You guys on the stream, you have to cook your own coffee at home. But make sure that you follow our social stream, uh, social media accounts at YouTube or Facebook, and I think that we are Instagram and Twitter as well. Um, I want to thank uh, Nola Games to come today, share your thoughts and processes, and I want to wish you a lot of luck. And you all guys here, go and play the game as well. So thank you, everybody, and see you on the next one, which is in 2020. Bye.